Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 34 years, we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Sister Simone Campbell is a religious leader, attorney, and poet with extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systemic change. Since 2004, she has served as executive director of Network, a Washington-based research organization working to shape federal policies that end wealth inequality, reform the immigration system, and secure access to quality health care for all. Before coming to Network, she served as executive director of Jericho, an interfaith public policy organization in California, and she founded the Community Law Center, which provides family law and probate support to the working poor. A member of the Sisters of Social Service, she has led three cross-country nuns on the bus tours, focusing on economic justice, comprehensive immigration reform, and most recently, voter turnout. She's the author of the new book, A Nun on the Bus, How All of Us Can Create Hope, Change and community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Sister Simone Campbell. Thank you so much. What a treasure and treat to be here um, in sunny Minneapolis. Um, <laughs> I am a native Californian, so I always find snow to be an adventure, but I, did, I never really realized how it also goes with cold, so <laughs> it's beautiful, but chilly. Um, today I want to share a bit about what we've learned on our bus trip, a bit of history and then a bit of where I think we're being called in our nation and how to respond, and then I do look forward to our conversation following it. Um, the mystery of nuns on the bus. I mean, it is pretty funny when you think that sisters got on a bus and drove around the country and that became something in the media. Um, I, it's hard for me to imagine that the uh, notoriety that we've achieved, and I often joke and say, lead a quiet life, join the convent. I recommend it. <laughs> But what happened, how this all came about, was that in uh, no, uh, April of 2012, my organization, Network, was celebrating 40 years of working on Capitol Hill to make a difference, to affect social policy. And that 40th anniversary party on April 14th, that conversation of about 300 people who gathered was, how do we let people know what we do on Capitol Hill? How do we get our name out there? Because we were founded by 47 Catholic sisters in 1972. We were working as Catholic sisters first and then opened up to welcome others in as members, but not too many knew about us. Well, I can tell you, you must be very careful what you pray for, because what we had were some very small ideas, like a Google ad, because we couldn't afford to print one, or having a member get a member. Well, four days later, the Vatican answered our prayer. <laughs> because what happened was the Vatican named our little organization that at that moment had nine full-time staff, our little organization network was named as a bad influence on Catholic sisters. <laughs> we made the Vatican nervous. The, the real reason behind it, I think, was that we had supported the Affordable Care Act and got 59 leaders of Catholic sisters' communities to stand with us in supporting it. And our bishops, with some misinformation about what was actually in the bill, opposed it. And that was 2010. But I think the Vatican censure, some of that 
uh, goes to that political difference. But what we quickly knew was Catholic sisters are not about having the attention on themselves. My sisters in the Leadership Conference of Women Religious had to be very careful because they are created by Rome. But Network, our little organization, isn't. We have no direct connection to Rome, so they hadn't talked to me before they mentioned us, so I felt fairly free in trying to be a moderately sane face in the press to talk about what does it mean to do the work of Catholic Sisters. And what I very quickly discovered, though, was how the question rose up in my prayer, how can we use this moment for mission? How can we create something new here? And what happened when we asked people for help to get ideas is Nuns on the Bus was born. But it was born in a meeting in our office on May 14th, and it was like Pentecost, because no one remembers who first said road trip. But at the end, <laughs> But at the end of our meeting, an hour and a half meeting, we were going on the road. We were pushing back against the Paul Ryan budget. We were lifting up the works of Catholic sisters and we were going in a wrapped bus. Now, I had no idea what a wrapped bus was and I was fairly nervous that it meant some kind of music. But, <laughs> but it turned out it was a W-R-A-P bus, not an R-A-P bus. And the wrap bus is that gorgeous wallpaper for those of you that have seen uh, pictures of it or have actually seen the bus. It's a vinyl wallpaper. But I, what I want to share is as a result of that, what I have discovered is that people in our nation are hungry, hungry for an alternative that brings us together in community. We have been living in a society that is growing more and more fearful and frightened of each other, of the economy, of just about anything. We have been living lives of fear. And the bus goes every place and welcomes everyone. Uh, we've been on three trips. Our second trip last year was on immigration reform, and I will never forget a man in Birmingham, Alabama. In Birmingham, Alabama, where I expected there'd be protesters against us on immigration reform, we had a standing room only crowd. In fact, it was so big, we had to move out of doors so that everyone could be accommodated. Luckily, it was June in Alabama. It wasn't uh, November in Minneapolis. but. <laughs> But what we discovered was this man who was probably in his 50s, I got talking with him and he said, I can't believe you came. I cannot believe you came to Birmingham. I never thought we would be seen. And he got tears in his eyes. And I realized our hunger as a people to know we are not alone, to know that we are seen by others and that we are in connection. And that fear and polarization has so uh, sealed us up in ourselves that we hunger to be seen by another. And in that being sealed up, we develop a lot of judgments, judgments about the other. Uh, on this bus trip, we were in Charleston, West Virginia, and they found out I was from California. And one of the men, probably in his 40s, said to me, you one of those hippies? <laughs> I said, well, no, I don't think so. I'm a Catholic sister, but I don't think I'm one of the hippies. Well, I thought everybody in California was a hippie. <laughs> and what I realized was that we don't see each other beyond stereotypes that we only see each other in these labels. Then someone in the Charleston group said, you know, one of the things about the draft during World War II, hard as that was, is that we folks from West Virginia got a different experience. We got an experience of folks from all over the country when we were in the military. Now, while the military was hard, he said, it gave us an understanding of each other that I think maybe we've lost. Whoa. 
that for me underscored that the stereotypes and the expectations that we have of each other seal us away from knowing the truth. And finally, let me tell you about a man in Louisville. I practiced to say that right, Louisville. <laughs> And in Louisville, he was at a food pantry. It was probably in his mid to late 70s. He was there to get his, he, uh, his, some food for himself and his wife. They're on Social Supplemental Security Income, SSI, and get food stamps, but they needed a little extra help this month. And as he's sitting there, he said to me, uh, we were talking about how hard it was for he and his wife, and the kids had moved away, and they, had, they were the only ones they had. And then he said, you know, it's tough. It's tough. Sometimes I wonder how we're going to make it. But thank heavens for Shively, which was the food bank we were at. And the food bank then was about to give him the food that he needed, and I asked him, are you going to vote? He says, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, always vote, always vote. Well, I was really grateful for that. And then, then he added, I always vote straight Republican, straight Republican. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, all those programs that you're using to survive on, they have the policy of opposing. So I said to him, trying to be ever thoughtful, I said, oh, could you tell me why is that? Why are you voting straight Republican? And he said, Mitch understands me. Mitch understands me. And I realized that the hunger to be understood is bigger than any policy, any program, anything. We have a hunger to know someone else sees us and understands us, which then calls me to be a missionary to folks to let them know that I see you, I understand you. I, if you explain yourself to me a little bit, I'll do my best to get it. Let me tell you about a few of the people that I've met a few of the people include Anne, who has a master's degree, she told me, and her husband has a master's degree also. But they live in rural New York, and they lost their jobs in the recession. And when they lost their jobs, they lost their house. And the best job that they could get, she's working in a bookstore, and he's working in construction. It's seasonal. And they have four kids, and it's really hard. And they've moved into a two-bedroom apartment, and they're doing their best. She said that living on minimum wage, two minimum wages with four kids, six of them, is almost impossible. They have to ask questions like, can we afford gas to drive into the grocery store, or should we walk the two and a half miles? Can we run the, uh, the dryer in the winter to dry our clothes, or should we be a tent city inside? Do we have the money to have the kids play a sport or a musical instrument in school? Do we have the money just to get by? It is very hard, and it takes a lot of time. Then I met Robin at the White House, and Robin, is in her mid-20s, she told me that she, we were there for a signing, the presidential signing of an executive order to raise minimum wage for contract workers. And she was all excited because a friend of hers was going to get a raise. And she had this gorgeous blue dress on. It was a sapphire blue dress. And I told her it lo looked lovely on her. And she was so excited because she'd gotten it at her job where she works full time for minimum wage. And she'd paid $20.43 sense for it because it was on sale and she had an employee discount. She was so excited. But you know what? After we talked for a while, then she said to me, you know, you wouldn't know this by looking at me, but I have to live in a homeless shelter because I can't afford rent in this, in this area. And I thought, whoa. How we don't see beyond the surface of the bright blue dress to know the stories that people are carrying and how we need to listen long enough to hear the deeper story.
Let me tell you one more story about Margaret. Margaret, um, I have a picture here in my Bible. Margaret died in 2012. Here's, here's her picture, you can't see it on the radio, but Margaret, she has her Wisconsin 14 uh, t-shirt on, but she died because she lost her job in the recession, and when she lost her job, she lost her health care. And even though she knew she was a likely candidate for colon cancer, she couldn't get screening, and she ended up dying from colon cancer. Her sister, Jeannie, brought me her picture when we were on our first bus trip, and I held Jeannie and her partner, Lynn, and we cried, and I carried Margaret's picture with me. Margaret has fueled my commitment that no more Margaret should die. The Affordable Care Act is a significant step forward. It is a significant step towards a community caring for each other. But we need Medicaid expanded so that all those in Margaret's condition who have lost jobs who, and can no longer afford their health insurance get coverage. It is wrong in the richest nation on earth that Margaret's die for lack of health care. It is a moral issue. It is an issue for the common good. It is a patriotic issue. But you know what? I've been a passionate nut about making sure that no more Margaret's die and doing the best I can. But then on this last bus trip, I was in Lexington, Kentucky, getting ready for a rally. And this woman comes up to me, puts a hand on my shoulder and says, I just want to thank you for what you've done for my family. I'm one of Margaret's sisters, and you've brought healing to my family. Thank you. And I, I, I just got tears in my eyes. I get tears in my eyes now thinking about it because it was such a surprise. And Nancy just walked away. and Well, I ran after her because I had to give her a hug. And what I discovered was that my having heard Margaret's story from their other sister, Jeannie, then led me to lift up Margaret. But my lifting up Margaret provided them with healing because they knew Margaret's death was not in vain. That this senseless death that they felt guilty about that they hadn't been able to help had some meaning for them. And then I realized what we hunger for in our nation is this community where my caring about your story provides some healing to you and you provide some nourishment to me. And that when we live in a nation of fear shut up, we lose hope because hope is a communal virtue. Hope gives us the sense that we're in this together. And Margaret's story nourished me, but it nourished her family. So what do we do? How do we do this? How do we break out of this moment of paralysis and polarization? Well, I think we've got some missionary work to do and because you all are listening to this today, I'd like to create you all as missionaries for the common good. Missionaries to listen to stories, to ask the follow-up question. Too often, we're so hungry to tell our own story. Have you ever noticed that in a conversation? You're listening to a story, but only waiting to get in my point, my point. Did you hear the one about me? <laughs> We've got to have the discipline of inviting the other to tell the, their story so that we are opened up. Because hearing another story builds a bridge into my heart, and then my heart is broken open. This requires me not to protect my heart, not to have um, uh, armor around my heart, but to make sure that my heart is open, broken open. Because what I've realized is when my heart is closed up, and I only have room for about three or four people, and it's probably not you. <laughs> but if my heart is broken open, what I know is there is room for everyone. There are no limits at who's welcomed in. And having a broken heart also means that I cannot be obsessed by control. 
I can't be obsessed by fear, and I cannot be obsessed by thinking it's all about me. Where we are called is that in this journey to compassion, what the bus is about is to know that we are in this together. This is a call to the hundred percent to be community to create our future. Because what we know is that if we are not community, we're gonna lose our democracy. The polarization that we're experiencing now is dividing our churches, but it's really undermining our democracy. We cannot continue as in, in the unpatriotic lie of individualism. Our nation is founded to be community, to be the people of compassion for each other. And Pope Francis is wonderful in this, that he says that realities are more important than theories. And what we need to do is to hear everyone's reality. Because if we hear the whole of everyone's reality, if my heart is broken open to you and I hear your stories, then we can be begin to build peace. Then we can begin to weep together for the mess we've made of some stuff. Then we can weep together, but in that process, what I've discovered is then hope is released into the darkness. Hope is a communal virtue that you cannot go off by yourself and generate. You cannot say, I'm going to my room, closing my door and generating hope. Give me a while. You can wait a long time. What I know is that in this path to compassion, caring for others, being a part of each other, that is when we know hope. And so to conclude this part, I want to end with one of my poems because it is called Compassion's Path. And I wrote it after, um, on our way back from Iraq. <laughs> kind of like name dropping. On my way back from Iraq, this happened, but we got caught in a sandstorm coming, uh, driving from Baghdad to Amman in 2002 before we invaded, and it was terrifying, I'll tell you. But the driver of our um, uh, car, it was a big SUV type thing, handed a roll of scotch tape to Rick, who was sitting in the front uh, passenger seat, and said, if you see a crack starting to form on the windshield, put a piece of scotch tape on it uh, to try to stop it. Now, I have no idea if that would have worked, but I will tell you that all eyes were riveted on that front windshield. <laughs> and it went on for an, I mean, an interminable time. I don't know how long it was, but it was terrifying because we had to keep going on the highway and you couldn't see where you were going. That well, was exciting. And then finally we got to about a 10 inch wide band of rain and all of a sudden we were out into desert clear. Now, this is the poem that was given and it is the challenge that we face to find this path to compassion. And it goes like this. We walk a sandstorm of impotence, isolated dread, the demons of our day. We walk a sandstorm of half-truths, lies of ochre, beige, tan, sepia confusion, pelted, buffeted by winds of war. We walk a sandstorm of drifting elusive truth, wandering ways and blind following. We walk a sandstorm eroded by demanding doubt, overwhelmed by the horror swirling round invading lungs and lives. We walk a sandstorm of promised grief, aching temptation to hunker down and hide until a more propitious time. But in this time of alluring weakness, in this time of fearful groaning, cold, blind logic, anger rising, remember the clear-eyed anchor of our resolve Remember the eyes of Mayada, Sarah, Rita, Asan, Abdullah, Makbula, and many more. We may be blinded in the outward journey, but remember this inner core. 
May the eyes of family, terrors of family, set fire to our impotence, stoke our resolve, melt the cold stone of our hearts to yield to tears. For like rain, tears shed, settle sandstorms. Like rain, tears shed, clear the air. Like rain, tears shed, reveal the path. So let us weep. Let us embody healing tears. Let us be copious tears to settle our country's storm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Simone Campbell. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church, moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is social justice activist, Sister Simone Campbell. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our forum on Tuesday, November 25th. That's Tuesday, November 25th at noon, when public interest attorney Brian Stevenson will speak on the topic, Just Mercy, Reforming the Criminal Justice System. Our events are always free and open to the public, and further information can be found at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Sister Simone, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First question has to do with uh, the recent election just uh, last week. Oh, yeah, uh, Matt. You, yeah, <laughs> you remember that? Yep. Yeah, uh, one of the issues you've been working on uh, with uh, Network and, and your, your Nuns on the Bus tours have been voter turnout. Uh, that was the worst voter turnout, I think, in 70-some years. Yeah, what happened? They, no one was listening to you, apparently. Well, I think it really is worrisome, but it's because, uh, let me tell you about one man that I met in uh, Colorado Springs. We were door knocking, and this very tall, uh, distinguished-looking young man, probably late 20s, early 30s, told me he was a disabled veteran, and I asked him, well, are you going to vote? And he goes, nope not voting. I go, why not? We need you. He says, I don't think anyone wants to hear my opinion. No one wants to know what I think. And I realized here he put his life on the line for our nation, but he feels like no one wants his opinion. And I think it's that alienation, separation, uh, division that is really driving people apart. I was just up in Duluth, Minnesota. It's even colder up there, I'll tell you. And um, up in Duluth, I was at St. Scholastica at the college there, and a very bold young woman comes to the microphone and says, well, I hate to tell you this, but I didn't vote because it was, seemed like I just didn't know enough. It was so confusing listening to all the ads. I didn't know enough. And this is where the negative advertising is dri are driving people away because they feel like there is nothing to vote for. There's only things to be against. And if our youth is being turned off, our military veterans feel like their voice doesn't count. We are in really serious trouble as a democracy. And, and just driving around on a bus was not sufficient to overcome that. That's why we've got to get into community so we're connected to each other. So that there is an antidote for all of the money, all of the negativity, all of the ferocious stuff. So yes, we didn't turn out a whole bunch. Minnesota, you did pretty well, considering. But um, we've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to save our democracy. Uh, you referred to the gentleman who, who said, Mitch understands me. A, a bumper sticker used in Mitch McConnell's campaign said, coal, guns, freedom. What, what's that, what is that message? What's the, what is the, a candidate trying to say if that's the, the slogan? Coal, guns, freedom? Um, isn't that puzzling? 
I, I assume for in Kentucky that means jobs. Coal gets identified with jobs. The irony is, is Mitch McConnell's not bringing more coal back because what they've done with coal mining in, in Kentucky is that they do all this mountaintop removal so they don't need people. You just need machines. And, but the image is if I'm for coal, then I'm for eastern Kentucky. We went to Eastern Kentucky and it's really hard to see because they're seeing the degradation of their homes at the same moment they see the loss of the jobs and they haven't put it together. People have not made the connection. Um, and I think it's also with guns, oh, this is terrifying, um, because in, in uh, I, what I think that the, the Second Amendment allows is everyone to carry a musket. Um, <laughs> And that if you, that's what our forefathers thought, so let's carry a musket. Um, and that would make some sense. Hard to carry a concealed musket. Um, but I think, I think it has become in a, a rallying cry to identity of a rural person who wants to take care of themselves, who's afraid of government, who's afraid of community, who's afraid, period. And that is a huge worry that a gun gives you freedom when what really gives us freedom is to be connected, to be with each other, to know somebody has your back. That gives us freedom, not power or dominance. And so I think Mitch McConnell kind of was going with the things that tested well with focus groups but doesn't do well for our democracy. You're based in Washington, D.C. Surely you have yes. some allies in the halls of Congress. Can you describe some of those relationships? Name some names, maybe? Oh, name names, yes, yes. What did you know and when did you first know it? Um, <laughs> the, um, it? It is amazing. Yes, we have some very good relationships, strong relationships in D.C. Um, the, this summer, uh, Senator Durbin, who's a great ally of ours, <laughs> his people reached out to see if it was okay if he took me to dinner. It was very sweet. And then he asked if it was okay if he brought Senator Casey along. So we had a, we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And then he took me home. It was like being out on a date as a kid. It was fun. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but working in policy, it is quite possible, has been quite possible in the Senate to work across the aisle. Uh, your Senator Franken is doing some really good work at working across the aisle. Um, and we're able to partner in that in real specific ways. You have to have really narrow targets of things that work. Senator Elizabeth Warren also is working, trying to work across the aisle. Um, one, of, one of the worrisome pieces is that Senator Ted Cruz has said he is now declaring war on the Democrats and he wants to make the Senate as non-functional as the House of Representatives. So I think we've got some serious work ahead to say that that is crazy, that is not democracy. The way we solve problems is by coming together, not by being torn apart. So while we've got some good uh, connections, I think that it's really worrisome for the 114th Congress. We have work ahead. Let's talk about immigration reform. A number of questions coming forward about immigration. I know that's been an issue close to your organization's work. Uh, is there a possibility for some comprehensive immigration reform, you think, in this upcoming Congress? Uh, no. Next. Should I go on to the next question? <laughs> yeah. No, let, let me talk about it. Um, okay, President Obama is going to do some executive order. Uh, it won't, he cannot fix the problems in our system. He can only uh, do some work in executive action around the edges, giving some stays of deportation. Um, the problem with that is that it only lasts as long as the executive wants it to last, and any new executive will be able to change it. So uh, the immigration community made, some, of, some in the immigration community, I believe in this election, made a huge mistake by focusing on the president and uh, losing sight of the fact that it's Congress that's the problem. 
The Senate passed a bill, which is a quasi-okay bill, and then the House Representatives, we have the votes in the House Representatives to pass a similar bill, but John Boehner refuses to bring it up because he's afraid of the Tea Party. And so what we have to admit is that in the House of Representatives, we've got three parties, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Tea Party. And John Boehner is trying to be a leader of two of them and that have very different interests. The Republicans want immigration reform, the Tea Party does not. And it's that paralysis that has caused the demise of our efforts at immigration reform. The 114th Congress is worse than the 113th. So I really don't expect any significant uh, legislative action. We'll try, we'll keep pushing, because our nation is crippled by our broken system. Our communities are torn apart. Business is not doing well. Even the Wall Street Journal thinks it's a good idea to have comprehensive immigration reform. But the fear of some politicians against the Tea Party is, if, uh, about the Tea Party is what's holding this up. So I say what Jesus said, fear not. Well, uh, several questions about your relationship with the Vatican and particularly your, your... Or not. You knew we'd get there, right? Uh, you, you mentioned Francis in your remarks. Yes. Uh, have you met the, the new pope? And uh, if you did, what would you say to him? Oh, good question. Uh, no, I didn't meet him, but I did get, uh, I sent him my book <laughs> with, uh, with a, a letter in Spanish uh, telling him that I was sending the book to him uh, in gratitude for all that he had done to lift up our spirits, the spirit of the passion for justice, and that I wanted him to just have this little token of one, my care, but also that he might want to know a bit more about the life of women religious in the United States. And then just um, about when I got back from the bus a week ago, I had a response from a Monsignor who said that the Holy Father appreciated receiving the book. So that was kind of nice, and sent his picture. So it's now on my desk, it's very sweet. <laughs> um, if I met the Pope, um, what I would really want him to know is that I hold him daily in my prayer, that I want to be supportive to him and to the work of the Spirit um, in him, and to be grateful for the breath of fresh air and to know my gratitude, my profound gratitude for the way he's living the gospel in a very challenging time. Uh, my church is not noted for rapid change. And uh, <laughs> the, one of the benefits of having a monarchy, uh, the, the style of our governance is monarchies. And um, the, the benefit of that is that when you have a new monarch, it can make a big difference, and that's what we're seeing. So I, I would want to make sure that he knew he had my prayer and my support, and that I am deeply, profoundly grateful to him for lifting up the needs of everyone. The, the one line, just his saying, who am I to judge, was so freeing and so hopeful. Let's talk about middle management in the <laughs> Catholic Church. Uh, All right, that's what I call them. Yep, yeah, that's you, what I call them. You've run into some, some uh, adversity from the middle management in the, in the Catholic Church. You've been uh, forbidden to speak in some Catholic yes. parishes. Uh, talk about that tension in your own life as a woman religious. How does it, how does it feel to be in a system that uh, is, in a sense, rejecting you at some points? Well, here's the irony, is that the Holy Spirit is in the midst of all of this, in my view, making mischief. Making mischief. Because, but for the conflict, we wouldn't have all this notoriety. And the Holy Spirit is using the conflict to stir all of us up to be way more public than we've ever been in our lives. and. And to find out that we have this amazing support as women religious in the United States is humbling and so comforting. I, I can't say that it's, it's uh, painless, it's not. It's painful, it's painful. But the fact is that 
We all, it, it, the, our Christian faith teaches us that the journey is through the pain to life. And that's exactly where we're being led, is from the pain of judgment and misunderstanding, righteousness, certitude, and the temptation is to become equally righteous and certain and arrogant and judgmental about them as they are about us. But this is where prayer is key. Prayer is key. And where I am drawn is to care for everyone, radical acceptance of everyone, including those that are judgmental of us. Because otherwise we become just like them. And I've discovered that the fighting um, in prayer, that fighting, uh, we often think of fighting as pushing back against, you know, one fist pushing against the other. But where I'm called in prayer is to fight for a vision that's not against anyone, but it's for the 100%. It's for all of us, where we are all included. Even the bishops who say I can't talk on their property because <laughs> it is about all of us. And the spirit is using the negative critique, this, this silly criticism to get more people involved. Can I tell the, the South, yeah, uh, there's a South Dakota story. I, you're close enough, you know South Dakota, you know? And uh, I, even, I was- They'll even know Yankton, you can- Yankton, South Dakota. Not too many people know Yankton, South Dakota. But I was going to speak at Mount Marty College at Yankton, South Dakota and about Medicaid expansion. This was a year ago. And um, the, I got quoted in the front page of the Yankton Gazette before I spoke there large circulation for Yankton. And the Bishop of uh, Sioux Falls uh, took some exception to what I said. And so he sends a letter to his priest saying he's not endorsing Sister Simone Campbell's speech at Mount Marty College. And um, so that got on the front page of the paper uh, on the day that I was speaking about Medicaid expansion. And here's the gift of the Spirit is that we had over 350 people, it's standing room only, in Yankton, South Dakota, <laughs> all to hear about Medicaid expansion. <laughs> and we got the former lieutenant governor, who's a good friend of the governor, to listen. He came, and then the next day, it was on the front page of the Yankton Gazette, a good account of why Medicaid expansion makes sense for South Dakota. But it's the Holy Spirit that used the criticism, because I'm sure if it hadn't been, if there hadn't been the conflict, well, I might have had 20, 30 people, maybe a few nursing students. But it was a huge event, thanks to the Holy Spirit. So you have to maintain the perspective that all works to the good. It's just a little painful in the process, that's all. So you, you confront conflict and resistance in your own uh, tradition within your own tradition oh, also yes. in in the political environment in Washington DC you're confronting a Congress now that's going to be harder to deal with on with your issues how do you maintain your your spirit and renew your soul in the face of such opposition can I present exhibit a everybody who's here um, this is where we have to be community to each other because we cannot do this work alone Jesus in the gospel did not send anyone out by themselves always sent folks out two by two or in a gaggle. I mean, you hear accounts of, you know, women walking to the tomb and there was a whole bunch of them. Um, you get the Last Supper where everybody, everybody and their brother and sister came, it appears. I, I mean, there's always community in our faith tradition. And that's what keeps us going. That's why the bus is so nourishing to me is to know real people and to know the importance. But the other piece that we have to remember is that leadership will come from the people. Leadership will not come from DC. Leadership needs to come from us. And we, the people, have got to stand together and claim our democracy, work out this huge differences, have conversation across the barriers, across the polarization, find ways to build bridges, because we've got to change how we function as a nation. So I'm out doing missionary work, and with folks like you, it keeps me going. So. DC, when I get too upset, I think, oh, I gotta get back on the road again. Go find my people. I have to find my people. That's what we need. We need each other. That keeps us going. 
Let's talk about politics and money. Uh, this... <laughs> I wish I had more of it, yes. <laughs> Both politics and money, probably. Yeah. One of our questioners picks up on your metaphor. Can we affect change in Washington without getting the sandstorm of money out of politics? Oh. Good question. Well, one of the interesting things is, is that several of the candidates in the uh, November 4th election who had the most money lost. So money does not always win, but what happens is money is driving people out, like the examples that I gave you. And so I think uh, we need a constitutional amendment or brain transplants on the Supreme Court, I'm not sure which, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not covered in the Affordable Care Act, so it won't work. But um, would, would that be among the Catholics on yeah, the Supreme Court? Yeah, well, I know we've got so many of my people there. It's really yeah. horrifying. Um, uh, seriously, it is horrifying. Um, the challenge, I think, is, is that it will take a constitutional amendment, and it's, it takes time. It takes a long time to do it. And my apprehension is that we don't have the guts or the will to do it as a people. And that's what we've got to do, or find alternatives. We've got to provide the leadership that says, hey, we can come together and make a difference. We can change this around. Money is not the end of the story. And so helping, like, the young woman up in, at St. Scholastica understand what's going on in a ballot, helping folks know that their voice is required. But we've got to do it not just on election day, we've got to do it between now and the next election day. Build the community so that the community is strong enough to stand up against this foolishness. And once it quits being effective, driving people out, once it quits being effective, they'll stop spending their money that way. Because I, what I'm trying to do now is to set up some analysis so we get to the folks so they see that they didn't get their money's worth. Let's find alternatives. That's what we have to do is find alternatives because it takes a long time to get a constitutional amendment. We got to work on it, but we've got more to do besides that. Your, your work grows out of the uh, long tradition of Catholic social teaching. Uh, Protestants uh, and other people of other faith have, have similar kinds of teachings. Are you finding allies in other faith communities? And can you give some illustrations of your work together? Oh, absolutely. Um, I am the co-chair, when I'm in DC though, I do a lot of traveling. I'm the co-chair of what's called the um, heads of Washington offices, the interfaith uh, gathering of folks from the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Sikh community. We also have a Buddhist now joining our group where we work closely on uh, policy issues from an interfaith perspective in DC. There's the Washington Interfaith Staff Community where we work on topics together. Um, and then dearest thing of all, I get invited to speak to a whole bunch of different uh, in different faith traditions and been in a Jewish temple and spoke at the Unitarians big national gathering in Providence, Rhode Island. I, and the other group to, that I want to mention too is labor. Uh, many of the labor unions are hungry, hungry to know that individualism is not going to really trounce our whole nation. So that's another place where community is found. And I've had the opportunity to speak at a bunch of uh, national labor gatherings. But it's, it's this hunger to know we're in this together. And I go any place where people are hungry. How do you suggest a faith community might move from learning about social issues, which a lot of our faith communities do quite well, to advocating for change in social systems? This, uh, thanks for that question. That's a really good question because I think this is where our academic study is lovely but insufficient. Because our academic study in, uh, wakes up our minds. But unless your heart's broken, you're not gonna change your behavior. And so what you need to do, I think, is talk to some folks and hear their stories. And you've got a lot of opportunities here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area or all around Minnesota to hear stories and let your hearts be broken open. Uh, having heard Margaret's story, I cannot not advocate for Medicaid expansion. Having heard the story of Robin, how can I not advocate for good housing policy as well as the raise in the minimum wage? I mean, all these folks break my heart open, and then become, it becomes urgent. 
urgent because I know the people that are being affected by this. And so I think sometimes within our churches, we can get too academically satisfied that we've done a good study hall, a good study job, we did lovely, but we've got to get active and let our hearts be touched. Hear the stories, hear stories and you'll be changed. That's, I think, one of the reasons why we avoid hearing the stories is because it's also a challenge to us to be changed. You have a fourth tour for the nuns on the bus. Oh. Where, what's the issue that's gonna take the bus on the road next time? I don't know, stay tuned for the Holy Spirit. I have no idea. What, what we're looking at doing next year though is what um, is creating round tables, business round tables. We did one business round table in Chicago on the bus that was fascinating. It was fascinating because I discovered this one hedge fund, it was six entrepreneurs, and this one hedge fund guy was lamenting government regulation was too complicated. And then as we talked about it, we found out, well, it got complicated because it was simple, and then all the businesses hired lobbyists to get their exceptions into the th works, and then it got really complicated with everybody's exceptions. So business started it and then they lament against it. So we got to have some more conversation about that. And thank then, you. Thank you, Sister Simone. That's all we have time that, for. Appreciate your word of hope and your good work. Thank you very much. Thank you.